So this week we're jumping back uh, to the Feynman diagrams that we were talking about before. And um, what we talked about was QCD in the last lecture. So the consequent, we discussed the consequences of the gluons. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Uh, carrying a color charge, so that unlike a photon, which um, <coughs> should have wants me to drink, um, so unlike a photon which is uh, electrically neutral and doesn't couple to the electric field, I mean it causes the electric field, but doesn't couple to other photons. A gluon has a color charge; it has this color-anti-color -color mixture. And this is what makes the color fields attract and leads to this, this quark confinement where we end up with uh, this sort of, uh, if you've got your quark and uh, anti-quark here, you end up with this sort of uh, tube of gluons between the two rather than a field that spreads out like you get for uh, an electric field. And this is because the gluons carry a charge, and so you can end up with these vertices of two or three gluons uh, uh, coupling together, which gives us this uh, um, confinement at low energy. And we also talked about renormalization, how the vacuum can shield or enhance forces. And so for an electric field where you have electron-positron pairs, those act like water molecules where you get a dielectric constant and it shields a charge. If you plunge a charge into water, the uh, uh, dipole molecules shield the electric charge. And the same thing happens in the vacuum, obviously to a lesser extent. And so a vacu the vacuum actually shields the charge. It's something called well, rather inaccurately, va vacuum polarization. So the, the vacuum shields the charge, and the higher the energy you get to, the closer you can get to sort of the naked electron, and you see a, a far bigger charge. Um, but we don't actually talk about it in changing the charge of the electron. What we talk about it is enhancing the strength of the electromagnetic force. So the higher the energy, the stronger the electromagnetic force becomes. The opposite happens with gluons because the, you, don't, you see less and less of the gluon field surrounding the uh, quark, and so it becomes weaker. And so at high energy, you end up with um, uh, 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 asymptotic freedom. Um, so low energy, QCD becomes non-perturbative because you get these enormous couplings and confined energies. At high energy, you get this asymptotic free freedom. And then we talked about the uh, 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 recent evidence from the LHC for these quark gluon plasma, which is a new state of matter where essentially you get to a high enough energy and the proton will melt into a, a collection of quarks and, and gluons. Okay, so now we are going to talk about how to draw Feynman diagrams for the... Oh, sorry, you had a question, yeah. So, uh, just first, um, so if the vacuum polarization for it, it depends on the, the field. So for an electromagnetic field, right, you have these... So for an electromagnetic field, you have a positive charge here, and you have all of these little... Uh, you know, electron-positron pairs that pop out of the vacuum and disappear again. And they pref although they can come in any orientation, near an electric charge, they preferentially come in an orientation like that because it's a lower energy state, right? So they're more likely to be able to come in this sort of configuration. And if you look at the effect of this, it shields this charge. Right? I mean, if you, if you think about the same sort of thing in water, where obviously they're not coming and disappearing, right? They're, they're water molecules. Um, if, you, if you have a dipole like this for a water molecule, and that will shield a charge, and you see this in the, you know, the Coulomb law becomes uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon r, r squared. And since this is greater than 1 for water, it's shielding, it's reducing the force or if you think of the electric field where you've just got Q, it's reducing the electric field strength. So this is also, it, it looks like this D in the, in the fine, in the, uh, fine structure causes the weighting of vertices as well? Exactly. Yeah, well, what happens is, that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that today, the fine structure constant varies. It doesn't, it's not constant. We call it a constant because at the time it was thought to be constant. Uh, but now we can actually measure it at higher energy, we can actually see it varying. 
and it's the same. It's the reverse for the um, it's the reverse for the color charge because uh, the, these fields are attractive as well, right? If the extra charges pop out of the vacuum, it, you, they become attractive. They don't shield the charge; they actually enhance the charge. And so, the fewer that you see, uh, the less charge you see, the less strength of attraction you see. Right? But we'll, we'll we'll talk about the actual how these things vary in, in at the end. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, it's not the end of next lecture, it's the end of this lecture. Okay, so first thing to introduce, we know we've got two bosons for the weak force. We've got a neutral boson and a charged boson. So this is the Z and the, uh, uh, and the W. And the thing that the weak force couples to is something called weak hypercharge. Now, we'll worry about that later in the course, exactly what that is. Um, but, but essentially, every fermion carries weak hypercharge. So a Z will couple to an electron, but it will also couple to an electron neutrino. Right? And this is something that a photon will not do. So you will see a photon do this because the electron carries an electrical charge. You will not see a photon do this because the neutrino is neutral. But a Z does not couple to electric charge. It couples to this thing called weak hypercharge. And all uh, uh, fermions carry, all the known fermions, carry this weak hypercharge, right? So a Z will couple to any fermion. So since we've got both Zs and photons being able to mediate in some diagram, so if we look now, we go back to our E plus, E minus. So, oops. So this is our process we looked at before, E plus, E minus, go to mu plus, mu minus, and before what we had was we had the, the photon uh, sitting here and coupling to the electron and positron here and the muon antimuon here, but we no longer have to just have a photon. We can also have a Z, right, because that couples to both uh, as well. And so in this sort of diagram, you actually get a mixture. You can get a mixture of a Z or a photon, right? So both of these uh, uh, are possible, um, the difference being that, of course, the Z has a huge mass, and so at low energies, this Z is going to be a long way off its mass shell, right, because it can't have 90 GeV of mass energy if these guys coming in only have a few GeV. So at low energies, this Z contributes almost nothing, but once you get to high energies, then the Z can contribute a, a large fraction of the cross-section once you get, particularly if you're sitting at 90 GeV on the Z mass uh, uh, itself. However, if we look at something like this, now this admittedly is a rather unusual process, uh, you know, a muon collision producing a pair of quarks, right? This is not a, a everyday occurrence because the cross-section for this will be vanishingly small, but not zero. Um, and so if you've got a diagram like this where it probably actually would have been better if I'd have flipped that round and I had uh, two, an up and an anti-up quark coming in and, and exchanging through a Z and producing a pair of uh, neutrinos. That would have been a better way of doing it. Um, but nevertheless, right, if you have a process like this, then only the Z mediates. The neutrinos will not couple to a photon, so in that case, you only have a Z, right? You do not have the option of a photon because these guys uh, at this side have no charge, right? So even though the up quarks would be able to couple to a photon, the neutrinos can't. So you can't have a photon in this diagram. Okay, so that's it for the neutral case. It couples in many ways just like a photon with this additional uh, uh, coupling to neutrinos. But for the charged vertex where we've got a W boson here, we've got a complication because now we've got a mediator that's carrying an electrical charge. So it's similar to when we had the gluons carrying a color charge. Now we have a mediator that's carrying an electrical charge. And if we look at the way it's going to couple to an electron, we clearly can't have what we had for the Z, which was an electron coming in here and a positron coming out here, or sorry, or an electron coming out here. Because if we had an electron coming in, and an electron coming out, it, remember we've got to conserve charge at a vertex, and if the W is carrying a charge, then we can't have the W take a charge off here and an electron come out, because that would mean that we're, we're creating negative charge. 
right? So similarly, you know, if you were building an electron-positron collider, you can't uh, collide an electron and a positron together because that would give you something with no net charge and have a W come off, right, because the W has a charge. So what happens here is the W boson will convert an electron into an electron neutrino, right? Because remembering we're conserving the lepton flavor, um, and so if you have an electron coming in here, you'll have an electron neutrino coming out, or if these two are coming together, you'll produce a W, right? So it couples an electron to an electron neutrino, and that's simply in order to conserve charge. Or, for example, if that was a W+, plus, it would be coupling a positron to an anti-electron neutrino. Sorry, other way, yeah. It, it depends on which way around we're interpreting the time flow in this diagram, right? But you, you have to have an electron and a neutrino uh, um, coupling here to the, uh, to the W. Now, when we come to the quarks, we can still get, we've still got this charge conservation to worry about. Well, if we look at this diagram, ah, So if we look at the diagram we've got here, uh, right? Well, here what I've got is I've got an up quark with a charge of plus two thirds, and that's coming in. The down quark has a charge of minus a third going out, and so therefore I have to have a charge of plus one going out of the vertex this way in order to conserve charge, right? Because if I've got two-thirds coming in and this has got minus one-third coming out, then these two together, which are the two that are sort of leaving the vertex, are equal to the plus two-thirds that's coming into the vertex, right? And if you reverse the directions, that still works. You can think of this as plus a third coming into the vertex. If it's an anti-down, it would have a charge of plus a third, uh, with plus two thirds, so that would give you plus one flowing out of the vertex. All right. So, in fact, this was something that I think someone, somebody was asking me about uh, the other day. When it comes to interpretation of Feynman diagrams, what you should do is you should look at these arrows. Right. So these arrows, if you've got a fermion, these these only exist for the fermion line. These arrows show the direction of flow of the particle. Right. So you can interpret this vertex in multiple ways, and the Feynman diagram does not tell you what the right way to interpret it is. You have to use that in the context of what process are you talking about, right? So this Feynman diagram could be for uh, uh, you know, some sort of virtual electron. It would have to be one off its mass shell, but it could be for an electron going to a W boson plus an electron neutrino. That would be one interpretation of this vertex. You could have it interpreted as an anti-electron neutrino and an electron colliding to produce a W boson. Or you could have it interpreted as a W boson decaying into a positive. If it was flowing this way, it would be a W boson decaying into a positron and an electron neutrino. Right? So the way when you actually draw a Feynman diagram, the way you interpret it depends on the situation that you're dealing with. There is no you know, built-in arrow of time. The convention that we're using in this course is that you know, we go left to right. So it's a little bit different when I'm just drawing vertices like that. But you know, if, if this was a process, then it would be an anti-electron neutrino and an electron coming in and producing a W that's going in that direction, which is why I labeled it, labeled it as, a, as a W minus. And here, it would be an anti-down and an up quark combining to form a W plus, right? But that arrow is just a convention that we're using. You can stick the arrow of time going from the bottom up to the top. You could have it going from this way here, right? You can reverse the direction of any of these things and you just reinterpret what the diagram is meaning, right? And it's the same diagram, same vertex in each case. So that can be a little bit confusing, but really, you know, it, that, that's, I mean, the, the interpretation of the diagram that you draw depends on what process you're talking about, you know, what particles are coming in and what particles are, are, are going out, right? And that's not, it's not built into the diagram, it's something that you add 
uh, extra. Okay, so when we're dealing with W bosons, oh yeah, there's a W missing there, sorry. When we're dealing with W bosons here, then we have to have a change in flavor of the quarks in order to conserve charge, right? Because we've got a charged uh, a w, because we've got a charged uh, a carrier here, we can't have a down quark coming in and a down quark going out because then there would be no charge conservation, right? So the fact that this thing has a charge forces us to change the quark flavor. So we can now draw a diagram for beta decay. If you remember, beta decay is where you've got a neutron usually embedded in a nucleus, but here we'll just, we'll just assume it's sitting outside, decaying into a proton, which has got a lighter mass. And so what you've got to do is you've got to convert a down quark into an up quark. And the only way you can do that is with a W boson because none of the other interactions we've talked about, the strong interaction would have a down quark here and a down quark there. So would the electromagnetic and so would a Z. A neutral Z boson would have the same thing. Right? It's only the W boson that allows us to change a down quark into an up quark. Right? We can't do it any other way. Um, so we have a W boson here, and then this W boson can decay into an electron and an anti-electron neutrino, right? Because the diagram, the convention is left to right. So we start with a neutron, we end up with a proton and an electron and an anti-electron neutrino, right? So this is the precise process for um, a, a beta decay, right? But now written out in full, right? With our, with our weak boson being the mediator here. This is also exactly the same mechanism where a charged pion will decay into a muon and an anti-muon neutrino. What you have is in a charged pion, you've got an anti-up. Uh, in this case, it's a pi minus. So it's an anti-up with a charge of minus two thirds and a down with a charge of minus one third. Um, and I've got the arrows the wrong way. Yeah, those labels, sorry, are up the wrong way around. That should be the down quark and that should be the anti-up because the, uh, the arrows should point in the, since we're going this way, I've got to go against the arrows for the antiquark. So the only way I can have these two coupled together is through a W boson, right? I can't do it through anything else because that would conserve the individual quark flavors. Yeah. Um, for converting, well, okay, yes, if this was a pi plus, this would be a W plus. Is that what you're asking? No, for the first one. For this one? Yeah. If you think that uh, W boson goes, uh, goes to the bottom, then can be swap? No, you can't, you, you okay. In, Oh yeah, no, you could have a W plus, yes. Yeah. So if I'd, have, if I'd have drawn this as a pi plus, it could be, you'd have a W plus involved in the decay, right? I mean, the, the only thing that determines the sign is which way you're, you're considering the motion of the W, right? So if I'd have started here with say, um, I'm trying to think now, uh, maybe a, a delta plus um, or a delta double plus decaying to, um, no, because that would go through a strong interaction. But yeah, I mean, if I just started with the right baryon here um, and ended up with, so a positive baryon here and a neutral baryon here, then, and, and then this is decayed by emission of a, of a W plus, right? That would be entirely possible, right? It's, it's, I mean, certainly W pluses can be involved, right? In this case, because the neutron, I mean, if, for example, if the proton had a higher mass than the neutron, I mean, that would cause us lots of problems because we'd all be decaying all the time. But if the proton had a higher mass than a neutron, then this process would involve a, a W plus uh, in being emitted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yes, they, they do. The W is, the W minus is the antiparticle of the W plus. Right? I mean, if you just reverse the direction, one becomes, you know, it's negative or positive depending on the direction of time. The Z and is like the photon. The Z is its own antiparticle. So a Z, uh, you know, like a photon, it doesn't make any difference. It, 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 it's, it, it is its own antiparticle. OK, 
Okay, so now we have things like this. We can, we can construct uh, uh, weak decays. So if we look at the delta zero baryon here, so this is the neutral uh, uh, baryon from the decuplet, right, from the Gell-Mann's eightfold wave, but the decuplet. Um, so this is a delta zero baryon, and it can decay into a proton because this has got a higher mass than a proton. And generally speaking, as long as there's not some conservation law to prevent it occurring, any higher mass particle can decay into any lower mass particle. Right, unless a conservation law uh, prevents it from happening, right? It, it's, it's always going to be allowed. So this decay can happen through the weak force. We can convert a down into an up, and then the weak uh, boson is, is emitted here. It's a W minus again, and this can also couple to quarks, so we can couple to an anti-up and a down and get a pi minus, right? You know, the only thing that stops a, a neutron can't do this uh, it has to couple to an electron and a neutrino because the mass difference between the neutron and the proton is uh, you know, a few well, it's tens of MeVs or even less than that, right? It's, it's, a, it's on the order of a few MeV, um, whereas the mass of this guy, mass of a pion is 137 MeV, if I remember, 100 and something MeV anyway. Um, Right, but the mass of this guy is 100 MeV, so this is not permitted in, in, in for beta decay because there isn't enough energy to create a pion, but with a delta decay, that's perfectly allowable. However, because we're now creating a pion here, right, we don't have to have a W boson. We can put a gluon in, and if we put a gluon emission here and it produces an up anti-up, then we can pair those up to produce a pi minus, and we can pair the other, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the anti up with the down to produce a pi minus, and we can couple these three together to produce the, the proton. Right? So this decay can go either through the weak force with a W boson or through the strong force with a gluon, but the strong force coupling is far, far larger. Right? This thing has alpha s at these vertices, this has alpha w. And okay, we haven't talked about exactly what alpha w is, but we said it was comparable to the electromagnetic force, a little bit stronger. So this is going to be of order, you know, one over 100, uh, slightly higher than that. But it's also going to be suppressed by this large mass of the W boson here. Whereas this guy is going to have alpha s, and there's no suppression because the, the gluon, as far as we know, is massless. Um, and so there's alpha s here and an alpha s here. This is a low energy process, so this alpha s is going to be of order one, right? It'll probably be non-perturbative. Um, and so this has got a far, far larger cross-section than this. And that's the, generally the case for weak interactions versus strong interactions. Uh, you go with the name, right? This is a weak force. This is the strong force. So, um, you know, there's a reason why we call it the strong force. So if you've got a competition between these two things, the strong force one is always going to win and, and will always be the, or almost always be the, uh, uh, the, the bigger contribution. So in this case, there is no competition. This thing is, is you know, at least one or two orders of magnitude bigger than the weak force. So what we've talked about so far is mixing quarks in a generation, right? So we've talked about an up and a down quark uh, coming together uh, with a W. But, and this is one of the things with the, uh, with the weak force, is it doesn't just couple different, quark, different flavor quarks within a single generation. If you remember, we have in the standard model, we have up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. So we have these three generations and the weak force doesn't just, uh, weak interactions don't just couple within a single generation, they will actually mix generations together. So it is, it is possible for a weak force to couple, for example, a charm to a down through the W bosons, right? Always through W bosons, never through the Z, right? So if we look at this, we already knew that something must be doing this because we talked about the strange particles that were discovered in the, uh, uh, in the, in the 40, well, no, later than that, 50s, I think it was. Um, we just talked about these strange mesons and strange baryon lambda that we discovered uh, in cosmic rays. And one of the things that was noted at the time that, that I mentioned was that these things had very long lifetimes. They had high masses, 
you know, far you know, higher masses than the, uh, than the pion. So the you know, K plus, well, the K0 has got a mass of 497 MeV compared to the pion mass of 100 and whatever it was MeV. Um, right, so this guy has got a mass of almost five times, well, certainly over four times the mass of a pion. And so you would naively expect this thing to decay very, very rapidly indeed. And what they saw was that these things had very long lifetimes. They decayed over, uh, over very, uh, uh, you had very long uh, uh, lifetimes compared to their mass. Now, the reason for this is, is that if you look at the quark content here, right, a K0 has uh, down, no, sorry, has anti, uh, no, anti down, isn't it? It's strange anti-down, right, in a K0 meson. And if we look at what it's decaying to pi zeros, a pi zero has up, anti-up, plus down, anti-down, and, you know, it's one over, is it root two, or something like that, right? But it's some combination here. But you'll notice here we've got strange quarks, and here we've got no strange quarks, right? So the reason these guys have a higher mass is because they involve strange quarks in their composition, and the strange quarks got a larger mass than the up and the down. But something, if it's going to decay into pi zeros, something has to get rid of that strange quark. And the only interaction that can do that that we know of is the weak interaction. So this decay here has to involve a, a, a W boson and cannot be electromagnetic, nor can it be involving the strong force. And since the weak force is suppressed by the large mass of this W boson, right, because this guy has a mass of 497 MeV over C squared. This guy has a mass of, uh, was it 82, I think it is? I'll say 82 GeV over C squared, right? So there is a huge you know, difference in the energy here. And so this decay through a W boson is heavily suppressed by the enormous mass that's required for the W. And so, but it's, since it's the only way that it can decay, it just what it means is that the k on has a long lifetime, right? Because the probability of decay is now suppressed. And so that means that the k on hangs around for a long time before it eventually decays. Right? It will still decay, but because it can't decay through strong or electromagnetic interactions, it takes longer for it to decay because it's suppressed by the, the decays are suppressed by the mass of this W boson. So <clears throat> the solution to this, so, so you know, we've now got this problem where well, we've got how do we couple something like a strange quark into these up and down quarks? Because before it looked like we were only coupling down quarks to up quarks. How do we end up coupling a strange quark uh, uh, to an up quark? Well, the solution to this was uh, uh, proposed in 1963 by a guy named uh, Kabibo. And of course, if you look at the date here, in, in Kabibo's time, there was only uh, this and the charm quark. So there were only two generations. You only had these two generations of quarks. And so what Kabibo came up with was a matrix that mixed these two generations, and since it was mixing two generations, it was a two by two uh, uh, matrix, which was really collapsed down to an angle. So he called it a, a mixing angle between these two generations. So what Kabibos uh, said was that these are the flavor eigenstates of the quarks. So if I've got a gluon and I produce a char you know, and, I, and I'm going to produce a pair of quarks, I will produce a pair of charm quarks in the charm eigenstate. But the states that the weak force look at are not these flavor eigenstates. What the weak force looks at is, for example, a C prime state that is mainly this charm state. So it's C cos theta C plus, and then u sine theta c. And similarly, you'll have an s prime state that's mainly s, it's s cos theta c plus um, d. And I may have got some minus signs wrong here. Hang on, maybe I should skip to the, oh yeah, I already got the Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, there's a minus sign missing here, sorry. So this should be minus 
lines there. Right, so what we have is these are the weak eigenstates. So these are the states that the weak force interacts with, but these are the states that the strong force and the electromagnetic force create, and they're also the states that propagate. Right? These are the mass eigenstates. So if you, if you create a, well, they don't propagate as free quarks, obviously, but they propagate bound up inside a meson. What you have is you have your, uh, you know, the K0 case, you have your uh, down and strange quarks as flavor eigenstates. So they, they exist as a, as a you know, strange flavor or down flavor of quark. But when they decay, what happens is the uh, weak force looks for an S prime eigenstate, and this is a combination of the strange quark plus the down quark states. And so this mixes these two generations according to this mixing angle, which is uh, uh, called the Kabibo angle, right, with theta C. So obviously this only works if you've got two generations of quarks. So what happened was, um, this was actually, um, well, the, the, the mechanism that Kabibo pr proposed was, was improved on by uh, Glashow, Iliopolis, and Mayani, um, which came up with what was called the Jim mechanism, and we'll talk about that later, um, which also sort of explains how some decays are suppressed and some decays are, are, are not suppressed. So this was, this was called the Jim mechanism. And then in 1973, uh, uh, the uh, Japanese physicists Kobayashi and Maskawa extended the two generations of Kabibo up to three generations with the discovery of the B quark, right? So the B quark came in 1973, and so they you know, took Kabibo's work and logically extended it up to three generations, which meant that you have to have now a three by three mixing matrix, right? You can't just get away with one mixing angle. You've got to go to matrix notation and have a, a, a three by three mixing matrix. And only a couple of years ago, um, Kobayashi and Maskawa won the Nobel Prize, and Kabibo did not, which raised a few eyebrows since he was the guy that actually came up with the idea in the first place. There are some important things we'll talk about which you get when you go to three quarks, but they sort of fall out of the fact of you're just extending. Once you extend Kabibo's work to three quarks, it's, it's I won't maybe quite say obvious, but it's pretty clear what's going to happen. So um, they got the Nobel Prize, but Kabibo uh, uh, missed out. Um, so <clears throat> this is what you get if you write down this mixing here, so these are the equations you end up with, but this is what you get if you um, write them out in, in terms of uh, a Kabibo, uh, in terms of a matrix, right? You end up with the mixing. Usually we, actually, uh, I should be careful. Normally we don't worry about mixing of the up quark states. We, you can actually fix it so that these, these states are actually the same. I should actually be careful with this, right? So the convention we normally take is we fix it so that the up-like quark states are the same for the weak force and the uh, uh, strong force, and we put all, confine all the mixing to the, to the down quark, uh, the down-like quark states. So when you do this, uh, you know, for, a two, for two quarks, you've got a down and you've got a strange, and so these are the weak eigenstates. These are the flavor eigenstates, and this mixing matrix just gives you a mixture um, you know, for the D and the uh, S prime states. Right? And you can see that it has one parameter only, and that's this mixing angle theta C. Now, obviously, this mixing uh, 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 equation here doesn't make any predictions for what this angle is. That you have to go out and you, you measure uh, decay probabilities, and you, you compare branching ratios. And this allows you to measure theta C. And experimentally, it turns out to be about 13 degrees. So what this means is, if you look at the cosine and sine of, of about 13 degrees, the cosine of 13 degrees is close to 1. The sine of 13 degrees is you know, about 0.1. So what it tells you is that this down weak eigenstate, the down like weak eigenstate, is mainly down flavor eigenstate. right? with only a little bit of the strange quark added in, right? So it's mainly down flavor with a little bit of strange uh, flavor on the side. 
and the weak strange eigenstate is mainly strange flavor with a little bit of down quark on the side, right? So predominantly you stay within your generation, right? So predominantly an up and a down are coupled together and a charm and a strange are coupled together, right? So these are the, these are the biggest couplings, but there will be a little bit of intergenerational mixing. Right? But that's suppressed. And since it's suppressed by this Kabibo angle, what we say is that decays involving an up to a, a strange or a charm to a down are Kabibo suppressed. And so in those cases, things are not just suppressed by the weak force, which is already makes things live longer, but they're also suppressed by the fact that you have to couple a strange quark to an up quark. And so when it comes to K on lifetimes, it's not purely just that this, this you know, weak force suppresses it because of the large mass of the W. It's also suppressed because you're going to have to couple a strange quark to an up or a down quark. Right? Well, a strange quark to an up quark with a W boson. So that suppresses it even more. And that's why these particles have very long lifetimes. So we have Kabibo suppressed decays. So we're now going to start talking about decays, so I'm just going to make sure that you're familiar with the, uh, with the vocabulary that we talk about for decays. So when we've got a particle, a particle will decay into any lighter particle that it can decay into, right? And by that, I mean any lighter particle which does not violate any conservation law or, or, or rule, coupling rule for interactions, right? So... Um, any decay which satisfies all the laws we've been talking about for the different interactions and results in a lighter particle, less massive particle, is allowed. Now, the reason you can't have a more massive particle is because if you think of things, the process has got to work in any inertial reference frame, and if you go to the center of mass frame of the particle, right, then it's at rest, and the only energy it has is the mass energy of that particle, and so if it decays into a more massive particle, the energy has not been conserved. Right? So even though you may look at it in the lab frame and you say, well, you know, I've given this electron you know, 90 GeV of energy, why can't it decay into a, a, into a proton because it's got 90 GeV of energy? It's got to be capable of occurring in every inertial reference frame. Right? And so in the inertial reference frame where the electron is at rest, it's only got the electron mass energy and it cannot decay into a proton. Right? Because even though in the lab frame it's got 90 GeV, which is more than the mass energy of the proton, in its own inertial reference frame it doesn't. So the process for a single particle decaying, the process is always downwards to less massive particles. The only way you can overcome that is, of course, is if you collide two particles at enormous energy, then you know, the, in, in the center of mass frame of the, uh, of the collision, you've got both particles' energies coming in, and so therefore you, you've got a lot more energy available to create mass. So, if it, so it can decay, and it can decay by any mechanism that satisfies all the laws we've been talking about, and in general it can decay by any of the three uh, electromagnetic strong or weak interactions. Nobody's ever seen something, well, they've never seen a particle gravitationally decay. I think they've now seen uh, neutron stars gravitationally decay. Um, uh, well, well, the pulsars, I think, are slowing down, and the claim is it's, it's due to gravitational radiation. Um, but obviously, in, in a particle collider, we are not going to see uh, gravitational decay unless these large extra dimension models turn out to be right. Um, so you're limited to these three, um, electromagnetic strong and weak decays. Um, but obviously, not all of these k's are necessarily going to be possible. We talked about the k on here. The lightest state involving a strange quark is the K0. There's nothing with less mass, or less, uh, that's neutral, right, because you can't create charge. So there's no lighter neutral particle meson with a strange quark in it, so it cannot decay via the strong force, cannot decay via electromagnetic force, but it can decay by this Kabibo suppressed uh, uh, weak interaction, right? So not necessarily all of these will be possible, and if multiple ones are possible, they're not necessarily going to be all equally likely. So for each possible decay channel, what we come up with is something called the branching ratio, 
and we call the type of decay based on the end products a, a decay channel. And so this branching ratio is basically the probability that when a particle decays, it will choose this particular decay channel to decay into. Right? And so the, this branching ratio here depends on a whole variety of factors. The simplest factor to consider is that strong, for, strong interactions are going to have bigger, bigger probabilities than electromagnetic, which are going to have bigger probabilities than weak, as long as you are considering these all at the same level, at the same number of vertices. Right? Now, it's, well, it, it's hard to imagine, but if you, if you had some process, I can't think of any off the top of my head, so I'm guessing that this is actually not a concern. Um, but you've got to remember that the more vertices you add, of course, the less likely something is to occur. Um, but generally speaking, strong interactions are greater, going to have bigger branching ratios than electromagnetic, which will have bigger branching ratios than weak. Um, but as we talked about with the k on, the weak decays can still dominate if you can't have uh, strong or electromagnetic decays, right? Which is, in fact, one reason why k ons turn out to be such a very interesting particle to look at, along with B mesons, so the, the ones that other people look at now, because you don't have the strong and the electromagnetic uh, uh, decays are not allowed, and you only end up with weak decays. And as we'll see, if out, out of the three forces that we have in the standard model, the weak uh, force is the oddball. Right? If there's anything weird happening, it happens in weak decays. Okay, so now we can do a quick comparison. So if we look here, we've got a D0 meson decaying to a K minus, and so we've got a charm and an up quark, or anti up quark in this case, and we have a W boson converting the charm into a strange. So this is within one generation, we're going charm to strange here and we're producing a pi zero, so we're coupling to an up and an uh, anti-down. So, sorry, not pi zero, up and an um, anti-down, so it gives us a pi plus. Right? And so the branching ratio for this decay is uh, 3.89, 10 to the minus 2. So if we change one of these vertices here, and now we look at a charm going to a down, so we have a d0 decaying into a pi minus, not a k minus now, but decays into a pi minus and a pi plus, right? then we're trying to couple a charm to a down quark, and this is Kabibo suppressed, right? because this mixing angle phi to C is only 13 degrees. So when we do this, we're going to get less chance that this type of decay will happen by about a factor 10. And again, we're producing the same product here, uh, a pi plus. And in fact, that's exactly what you see. This has got a branching ratio of 1.4, 10 to the minus 3. It's about a factor of 10 lower. It's not going to be a precise thing just based on theta c, because this guy has got a lower mass than this guy. And so that means that we're now ending up in a mass state where we only have two pions, as opposed to a kaon and a pion. And generally speaking, the bigger the, uh, the bigger the drop in mass, the more excess energy you've got left over to give, uh, to give the particles kinetic energy, and that means that you've got more phase space, right? So there's more ways, if you've got extra energy, there's more ways you can hand it out to the different particles, which means there's more ways that this decay can, can, can occur in terms of kinematics. There's more different ways to arrange the energy between these two pions than there is between this, this um, well, okay, now better be careful here because it's only a two-body decay. Um, so in that case, okay, in this case it doesn't, well, no, it still, it still, it still applies. The, the, you end up with a larger phase space here because these particles have got m more energy than these particles have. And so because of that, this decay is going to be slightly enhanced over that decay if everything else was equal. Right? But it's not equal because you have this Kabibo suppression here, and that dominates over the small mass difference. Right? And so that's why this branching ratio is a factor of 10 below that branching ratio. Right? So there's competing factors to take into account, but generally speaking, Kabibo suppression is always going to win. Now we can actually go one step further here because now we've got a charm coupling to a down, but we've still got an up and a down. Uh, quark here. So supposing we switch one of those for its 
uh, more generational cousin. Now, we can't switch the up quark here, because if we switch this to a charm, then we'd end up with a, uh, a D plus meson, and that would mean that we'd actually increase the net mass. So we can't have that. That's kinematically not allowed, right? Because we'd end up with more mass on this side than we have here. But if we switch this down quark for a strange quark, then we'd end up with a K plus here, and that would in fact be the, just like this decay here in terms of masses. Obviously, the Feynman diagram is different. And what we end up with is what's called a doubly Kabibo suppressed decay, because you get this Kabibo suppression factor here because you're coupling a charm to a down, and you're also here coupling an up to a strange. Right? So you've got two Kabibo suppression factors, one at this vertex and one at that vertex. Right? And so that makes this decay even less likely uh, uh, to occur, and you get about another factor of 10 uh, reduction in probability. Right? So you can see here, not Kabibo suppressed, one Kabibo suppressed, get the one drop in branching ratio, both vertices Kabibo suppressed, this doubly Kabibo suppressed decay, and you get an even bigger drop. Right? So when it comes to ranking which decays are most likely, um, you've got to consider this mixing between quark generations for weak decays. Okay, so we talked about Kobayashi and Maskawa extending Kabibo's uh, 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 mixing to three generations. And so now, instead of this two by two unitary matrix, which just has this one free mixing angle, you end up with a three by three unitary matrix. And this actually has uh, three independent mixing angles plus, and this is the crucial thing, which is in fact why uh, Kobayashi and Maskawa got the Nobel Prize. When you go to a three by three matrix, mathematics says that you've no longer just got mixing angles, you also have a complex phase. Now the reason for that is if you've got a, um, a two by two mixing matrix, you can always arrange it to remove the complex, if you've got you know, the, the arbitrary complex numbers, you can always you know, rotate it such that you get rid of all the complex numbers from the, uh, from the matrix. So that's why you end up with a, uh, just a single mixing angle because the complex phase you can just take out, right? With three by three unitary matrix, you cannot do that. And so you end up with these three mixing angles now, plus this complex phase. And the consequences of this complex phase are very important. And we will discuss that probably, I think it's on, on uh, week, uh, uh, a week today. So next Tuesday, not, not Thursday, but, but Tuesday. Uh, and this has consequences for the symmetries of, of the standard model. Um, so what we end up with is the Kabibo, Kobayashi, Maskawa matrix. And it looks like this. So here we've now got D, S, and a B. And we have this three by three matrix here. And so these are the couplings between an up and a down, up and a strange, up and a, and a B, and so on uh, down here. And these are the actual values of these couplings. So the first thing to note here is if you look at these diagonal elements, these are all very close to one, and so the Kabibo suppression is continued. In fact, in the third generation, if you look at the B quark, the reason B quark hadrons have got such long lives is because there is even bigger Kabibo suppression. So if you look between the down and the strange, their suppression is you know, about 3%. The B quark suppression is 99.9%. You know, in fact, this suppression is so large that We've never seen a top quark. We've seen B quarks decay through Kabibo suppressed things because we've produced you know, millions of them and we've looked at their decays. But we've never yet seen a top quark decay into anything but a B quark. Right? It's, it's supposed to be there. It should, if the standard model is correct, we should see a top quark decay into other products. And this is, in fact, something we can look for in Atlas because we'll have enough top quarks to actually start probing um, what are called rare decays. And basically, for top quark, a rare decay is anything that isn't a B quark. Um, so you, you can produce these things, but as you can see here, it's, it's even more heavily suppressed than the mixing with the other generations. And so Darren should also show you this right when on last Tuesday with neutrinos. Did you mention that? Neutrino mixing? Yes. yes. Yeah? Yeah? Good, All right? Because the, there's an equivalent matrix for neutrinos now uh, called the, not the PMS, the PM... NS matrix. 
Um, and I, I can't remember the names of the people. It's, it's done by, it's like the CKM, right? It's the initials of the people that came after it, uh, that, that, that came up with it. But this describes mixing between the uh, neutrino flavors. Okay, so important thing to remember, right? And this is where lots of people trip up when they're, they're drawing their Feynman diagrams. Z bosons do not mix generations, right? It's entirely possible, so you, know, you, can, you can write a diagram like this and it looks like it's gonna work, right? You've got um, plus two thirds charge here, minus two thirds coming in here, so it looks like it's neutral, it conserves charge. You know, uh, Z couples to an up, Z couples to a charm. Looks good, not allowed, right? You do not have these sort of couplings occurring. You, oh, Z will only couple within a generation and there are very, very stringent experimental limits on this, right? This is an experimentally determined fact that this vertex just does not occur, right? Now you can generate something that looks like a flavor changing neutral current, but it isn't a flavor changing neutral current. Um, and this is something we'll, we'll mention either next lecture or on uh, Tuesday, is you can construct something called a penguin diagram. Now, you may wonder why is it called a penguin diagram? Well, I don't know if you guys have heard of John Ellis. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a theorist at, at, at CERN. He, he actually came uh, and visited the department, well, not the department, he came to a conference we run uh, exactly a year ago, in fact. So um, he, he was in the 1970s, the story goes. Um, I haven't actually asked him, but I suppose I, I should do that and find out if it really is true. But the story goes that he was studying um, CP violation, which involves these penguin diagrams, as we'll find out in a, in a future lecture, and, um, uh, uh, and was down at the, uh, a pub in Geneva one night with a, uh, a grad, playing a game of darts with a, a uh, grad student and uh, the two of them apparently made a bet that you know, if, if she won, he was going to have to, or whoever won was going, whoever lost was going to have to mention the, put the word penguin in their next paper. And so apparently what happened was the, uh, the grad student started playing him and he thought he was, of course, he was going to be able to beat, beat her. Um, but then she sat down and, 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 a, and she had to leave and a, and a friend took over and, and he got royally trounced. <laughs> so the consequence was is that he had to figure out how to put penguin in his next paper. And since he was drawing, writing a paper about these type of diagrams, he decided to call them penguin diagrams. And so now people will actually draw them to try and look like a penguin. Um, so you end up with a diagram that looks something like, if you, try, if you draw it to try and look like a penguin, which I don't really recommend. Um, and then actually there's two sorts. There's, there's uh, electroweak penguins and strong penguins. Um, at least they don't have emperor penguins yet. Um, so what you have, So if you wanted to have something that would change and up into a charm, you could have a charm quark coming in here. You could have a W boson here and a up quark at this point. And then here you could have a down, strange, or a B quark. Any one of those would do. Um, now this by itself, can't necessarily just occur, right? Because it's, it's going to be suppressed. So what you actually want is usually what happens here is you end up with either a, you can have a photon or if you want a strong penguin. Um, so that would be an electroweak penguin where you have a photon coming off here. And this can actually, you know, couple to other things, right? It doesn't just, it can either be just emitted as a photon or it can couple to some other part here. So for example, this could be part of a, of a meson decay and we'll talk about kaon decays later. Or instead of a, um, this, what you can do is you can put a glue on here and then, you know, pair of quarks coming off the end, right? So these are the feet of the penguin and these are the arms of the penguin. If you go to Wikipedia and type in penguin diagram, they have a picture of a penguin standing there with Feynman lines uh, uh, tacked over the top of it. The, I, I'll draw it the way you normally draw it rather than trying to make it look like a penguin. So normally what you do is you draw it something like this. Uh, 
So this would be strange down and then and this would be down and down and then usually you want something like this coming in here and an extra glue on line. So for example, if you had a K0 uh, decaying to um, pi 0, pi 0, um, it can go through something that looks like this. And this is a penguin diagram. And this is the sort that John Ellis was actually interested in. Um, and, and so you, know, you end up with something that looks like this. And uh, these, of course, could be up and up, uh, up quarks here, and then you get pi plus and pi minus. Right, and then you've got to put the arrows on in all the right ways. So, uh, and we'll talk about these uh, in a lecture or two. So, this is in fact a very good way to annoy uh, an experimental, a theorist, non-experimentalist, is uh, if they, you, know, so you go to some talk and this theorist is up there saying, oh, well, you know, we're predicting this new signal and, and we've got all these new weird particles that, that we're introducing, you, you can ask them, you know, uh, does your theory introduce any flavor-changing neutral currents? Because it's very, very easy to do this when you're coming up with some new theory. The reason that this is allowed here is because you can see what's going on. You've got multiple vertices. This is not a first-order process, right? You've got a W coming off here. You've got up, down, uh, oh, not up, down. This is um, up, charm, and top quarks uh, getting involved here. And in fact, what happens is because you've got all three quark generations involved here, this complex phase in the CKM matrix comes into play um, uh, in these sorts of diagrams. So you can end up with a penguin diagram like this, but you can see here there's multiple vertices, and so the thing is suppressed because it's not a leading order diagram. So even though it looks like a flavor-changing neutral current in essence because you're turning a strange into a down, right, you are, you know, you're suppressed because you've now got four vertices um, and not just two vertices, right? So, so that is what stops it uh, having a big contribution. And, and there are very stringent limits on leading order diagrams that have flavor changing neutral currents because these sorts of things will be very, very easy to spot in something like a K on decay, right? Because now you'd start allowing decays that would turn a strange into a down uh, directly and you'd see these particles decay very, very rapidly. And so if, you ha if there are flavor changing neutral currents out there, they have enormously high masses that push them well out of the range of most experiments, right? Um, I mean, I'm sure we'll do a search for this on, on Atlas just to see if there's any signs of, of uh, flavor changing neutral currents, but uh, it's, it's very sort of difficult to do. And even sort of big theories like supersymmetry suffered from this, which is why they introduced this thing called R parity, which we'll talk about later if we get chance. Right. Um, although it's not always a bad thing because they introduced this thing called R parity to stop Susie having lots of flavor changing neutral currents. And um, when they introduced that, in fact, it was John Ellis who, who showed it, um, showed that this also meant that Susie could now, supersymmetry could now explain dark matter in the universe. So uh, sometimes, you know, trying to get around this can actually have a silver lining and you can explain things that you, you hadn't thought about. So, um, it's not always bad, but it's a good way to annoy a theorist who's keen on their new model to ask about flavor changing neutral currents because they will sometimes go to great lengths to try and suppress them. Okay, so we've talked about couplings between the bosons and fermions, but the weak bosons will also couple to themselves. So a Z here, W's remember, a Z will couple to, to two W's. You can get four W's coupling together. This is rather unlikely. I mean, this is theoretically allowed, but I don't think it's ever actually been measured to my knowledge. This has been measured. Uh, LEP2, I think, measured uh, Z to, I'm pretty sure measured Z to WW. I think we also did it at the Tevatron. Certainly, we can do this at, at um, LHC. Um, but I don't know how precise we'd be, so because we've got a lot of background. But anyway, this has been shown to exist. These guys, I'm not sure people have seen these. Um, I... I, yeah, because I, I mean, you can imagine it's pretty hard to collide Ws off each other. Uh, so you have to have some process with this in it. So I'm not sure these have been observed, but the theory predicts them. Um, similarly, though, you don't just have to have coupling between the W and the Z. Um, Ws have got electric charges. So they also couple to a photon. So you can have a gamma WW, and this has been shown to, to be there. Uh, and similarly, you can have these 
four uh, boson vertices involving gammas or a gamma and a Z. So the reason that we have this close relationship between these weak and electromagnetic bosons is because, as we mentioned before, the electromagnetic and the weak force are both aspects of the same underlying force. Right? This is just like magnetism and electricity were thought to be separate forces until the 1800s when uh, you know, it was shown that, that it's all, they're all aspects of electromagnetism. This is exactly the same thing that's going on here. The electromagnetic and the weak force are both aspects of a single electroweak force. And the reason that the weak force is so different is because it has this huge mass of the W and the Z bosons to contend with, right? The photon's got no mass. These guys have got tens of GeV of mass. And so at normal everyday energies, anything involving a W or a Z is massively suppressed um, because of the huge mass of these uh, uh, bosons. So if you actually look, at, if you go to higher energies and you've got enough energy that the mass of these WZ bosons doesn't matter, then you'll actually find that the strength of the weak force is stronger than the electromagnetic force. It actually has a stronger coupling constant. But when we come to do Feynman diagram calculations in, in the second half of the course, what you'll see is that you have this suppression by one over the mass um, of, of the boson, and then that's squared. Uh, so you get a, a very sort of heavy suppression due to this large mass. Um, uh, of the W and Z bosons. And this, in fact, the reason these guys have this large mass, the best mechanism we've got to explain it is, in fact, the Higgs mechanism. Um, and so this is, in fact, one of the big things we want to find at the LHC is, is this Higgs mechanism correct? Can this explain why the W and Z have these enormous masses? Okay, so what about the strong force, right? If, if we've unified the electromagnetic and the weak force, what about the strong force? Well, the problem is, is that you can do this, and you can say, right, well, you know, we'll drag in the strong force here. And if you look at the uh, uh, standard model, what that means is if you're going to unify the weak, uh, you know, so you've unified the weak and electromagnetic forces, and this is the for these are the forces that only the leptons feel, and then you've got the quarks, which feel the, uh, the, the electroweak force plus the strong force, if you introduce some sort of unified theory that unifies the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces, then you're going to have a symmetry between quarks and leptons, because these have got color charge and these have got no color charge. So if you bring them all together, you're going to end up with something that can couple to quarks and leptons, but in a different way. And so what you end up with are things called the X and Y bosons. So the Y boson, I haven't shown it here, but the Y boson has a charge of, I think it's plus one third, right? And these couple to both color charge and, um, uh, and the sort of usual electromagnetic or, or weak hypercharge, I should say, right? And so what you can do is you can now draw a process like this. And this is a problem because if you've got a proton with two ups and a down, well, two up quarks now can couple to this Z boson. And then the Z boson can couple to an electron and an anti-down, because this has got a charge of plus four thirds, this has got a charge of plus four thirds. And so you end up with a proton being able to decay to a pi zero and an electron. Now the reason in the standard model a proton does not decay is not because there aren't lighter particles with electrical charge, clearly there are. I mean, this kinematically is a perfectly allowable decay, but because there is no vertex in the standard model that allows you to couple two up quarks together, right? And, and at the end, couple to a you know, positron and an anti-down, right? There are, these vertices are not allowed in the standard model, but if you construct a grand unified theory, they do immediately come out of the symmetries, right? We'll talk more about symmetry next lecture. Um, but these are the consequences of constructing a unified model, and, and this is a problem because generally most people regard the proton as being pretty stable. So what you have to do is you can say, well, okay, supposing, you know, how, how long do protons live? And so, in fact, the same people that construct neutrino detectors, uh, there are neutrino detectors that consist of huge tanks of water. In fact, I think you guys almost do it on, on Ice Cube as well, right? Proton decay, yeah. So, uh, you know, if you've got a neutrino detector that consists of lots of water, frozen or otherwise, right, water has got lots of hydrogen in it, and hydrogen consists of protons. So what you can do is you can look for a proton going pop, 
um, and producing a positron and a, and a pi zero. This decays into two photons, right? So you can look for these decays of protons occurring. And there are limits, which I think now are at the range of about 10 to the 40 years or something like this, right? So to put that in context, you know, uh, age of the universe is of the order of 10 to the 14 years. So they're 26 orders of magnitude beyond the life age of the universe in terms of how long these protons last. Um, and the only way you can accommodate this is by giving these X bosons enormous masses. In fact, even pushing the scale of this unification up to about 10 to the 16 GeV is not sufficient. If you do it in the simple cases now, these simple unified theories are being excluded because they have a proton lifetime that's too short, right? So you, you, you know, it's possible that these decays are allowed, but they've got to be massively suppressed because the proton is not observed to decay very often. Um, in fact, it hasn't been observed to decay at all, right? So, but, but the limits mean that this has got to be very heavily suppressed. But the other thing to note here is that the baryon number minus lepton number is still conserved, right? And so this means that even if you allow these sorts of things to happen in the early universe, you're still going to end up with an equal number of uh, baryons to uh, leptons so that things would, um, will, will balance out. So that, that this is still conserved, but obviously baryon number and lepton number independently would no longer be conserved if this process is allowed, right? It's not clear that it does occur, but that's the, the, the theoretical measurement. So why would we even consider unifying the strong force? Well, I mentioned how the strength of force has changed as you go up in energy. So here we are, you know, this is about 100 uh, well, it's, it's square root, no, no, yeah, no, it's not. It, it's, this is a 100 GeV center of mass energy, so about the center of lap. And you can see this is the coupling strength for the electromagnetic force. This is one over the strength, right? So this is one over the fine um, coupling constant. Uh, there must be some extra factor in here because this should be about 137. Uh, and so here you have the weak and you have uh, a QCD. And you can see how these change as you crank up the center of mass energy uh, until you get to about 10 to the 14 or so uh, GeV, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 16 GeV, and then these all come together, but they don't really come together very well. Now, you might ask, what are the errors on these lines? Well, the errors on these lines are very small. This is, this is um, I think it's about six or seven sigma deviation here, right? So even though, of course, we can't actually access the physics here, we can predict how these things are going to change, and we can measure the initial slope of the lines, and so we can calculate this with some degree of accuracy. This, of course, assumes that nothing interesting occurs between, uh, that nothing outside the standard model occurs between this energy scale and this energy scale, right, which we don't know, but, you know, we can extrapolate. However, and this is the interesting thing, is that if you stick supersymmetry in there, right, so all we do is we add supersymmetry, roughly independent of the model, there's you know, thousands of different models of supersymmetry. It doesn't matter which one you include. Magically, uh, when this thing kicks in, they all seem to converge at the same point, right? So this is not necessarily an argument for, for so this is the strong force, the weak force, and the electromagnetic force. So it's not necessarily an argument for supersymmetry, but it's curious, right? It's, it's interesting that you add supersymmetry and suddenly all the forces uh, converge at about 10 to the 16 GeV. So, and it's roughly independent of supersymmetry. I think that you can't go much above sort of 10 or so G, 10, 10 or so TeV before supersymmetry comes in, otherwise these do start to get bad. Um, but roughly independent of the model, uh, just as long as you put it in sort of in the lower half of the scale, you get convergence within errors. Right? So uh, suspicious perhaps, maybe not an argument, but uh, curious. Okay, so, <clears throat> The end of the lecture here, I just want to summarize the rules we've been talking about and put these all together, right? Because when you're drawing Feynman diagrams, these are the things you need to remember, right? So when you're drawing a Feynman diagram, you've got to conserve charge at every vertex. You cannot have a vertex that creates charge or destroys charge, right? Otherwise, we will end up with non-conservation of electric charge. Color falls into the same bracket. Here, it's a little bit trickier because you've got these sort of multiple charges on the gluon and things, so you do it with color flow rather than adding up the positive and negative charges at a vertex, uh, although you could do it if you wanted that way. Um, but you've got to have this color charge, so you've got to be able to draw a color flow diagram through the vertices as we talked about. You have to conserve baryon number. 
There is no known process that violates baryon number. Something has to violate it. It's one of the Sakharov conditions of the Big Bang, um, which you know, is, is you've got to have baryon number violation because something had to leave uh, 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 leftover you know, neutrons and protons that, that are what makes up the, the visible universe. Uh, so something had to leave that behind. So there has to be something that violates baryon number, but it's not in the standard model. We don't know what it is. It has to be there. Um, or you have to assume that the Big Bang started with a net baryon number. Right? That's the other way. Not very satisfying to just sort of wave your hand and say, there we are, solved it. But it's possible. Right? That might be how it worked. So should be really high processors, but these are not in the standard model. Um, also, lepton number is conserved. The number of leptons going in has to be equal to the number of leptons coming out. And all the known processes also conserve, uh, so this is all the known processes conserve the number of leptons again. Of course, there has to be high energy processes that, that violate this. We also have approximate conservation of lepton flavor. So that means if you've got electrons coming in, you've got to have electrons coming out, right? You can't start creating electrons uh, you know, by de uh, uh, from muons. Um, so this means that you've got approximate conservation of the number of electrons, number of muons, and number of taus. Um, the violation occurs here is if you're talking about neutrino oscillations, which we typically write down like this because we don't exactly know how they occur. Um, so we usually write this down as a mixing where you have a muon neutrino mixes to say, an electron neutrino, although I don't think it does that. I think it's tau neutrinos is, the, is, is what it's thought to go to. But um, there should be some non-zero amplitude for this. Um, so we typically note that just by sort of an X uh, to say that this is uh, a mixing is occurring here. Right? Other thing to remember is we've got Kabibo suppression. So mixing between generations is suppressed. And we also have these uh, uh, other conservation rules apply. Um, so each vertex has got to conserve momentum and energy. So that's maybe not directly noticeable on the diagram, but this is what's behind the fact that you can't have you know, a 1 GeV particle decay into a 5 GeV particle, right? Uh, because that would, although you could write down a Feynman diagram for that, you could not write it down and conserve energy and momentum at all the vertices, right? So um, again, you've got to remember to conserve these quantities uh, at every vertex, and this will become more important in the second half of the course when we actually start doing some, some calculations. So the last thing to mention in terms of, uh, of, of, of rules is this so-called OZI, uh, uh, the Aussie rule, OZI rule. Um, sounds like some new weird cricket rule, doesn't it? Um, uh, but so the OZI, the Aussie rule, um, so decays. So there are other factors, right? This is just one example. We'll, we'll have another example next lecture. If you have a strong decay, right? So for example, if you take the phi, which is an S, S bar, uh, decaying into two k-ons, then this is a strong decay. And I can write it like this with two gluons involved or, or one gluon uh, coupling to uh, up quarks. But I can also ha write down a decay where I've got a phi here the S and the S bar annihilate to produce a gluon, and then the gluon couples to this whole chain of things, or you can have these gluons coupling over here, it doesn't matter. Um, but you can write this down, uh, you'd write this down like this. You would have to have, because it's a strong decay, the o, you, you end up having to have gluons in the middle here because you've got to have this S bar annihilate with the S, right? Because you can't change flavor in strong decays. However, the OZI rule says that if I draw a diagram, and at one point in the diagram, I can cut it in two by only snipping. So imagine I'm wanting to sort of snip this side and separate it from here. If I can do that by only cutting gluon lines, then the diagram is suppressed. So this decay process is suppressed compared to this. Right? Now, you might naively think, if it wasn't for this OZI rule, that this decay would actually be more likely than this decay because they're both strong processes, but this, you end up with two, uh, four, 500, G, uh, 500 MeV uh, um, uh, k-ons, and here you end up with 300 and something MeV uh, uh, pions. So energetically, this would be favored. But the OZI rule says that because I've got gluons here, it means that these must be high energy gluons, right? Here, I can give these gluons vanishingly small energies, right? They need very little energy at all. And as we saw from the strength diagram here, um, the 
this is the strong force. Well, it's better to do the strong force without Susie. But the strong force gets weaker, uh, stronger, because this is 1 over the strength. So the strong force gets stronger as you go to lower energies. So the consequence of that is that if I've got a process where the entire energy is transmitted through gluons, that means that it's a higher energy. Uh, the gluons have got to have a higher energy, and their coupling will be suppressed. And so therefore, this decay is suppressed because of that. So this decay is less likely than this decay. Right? Now, compared to a weak interaction, this decay would still dominate. But um, compared to another strong interaction, it's suppressed. OK, and so then I'll just quickly finish off with these. This was the last slide. So any decay to a lighter particle which is not prevented by conservation or will generally occur. Strong decays, if they're possible, are far more likely than weak decays or electromagnetic or, or, or EM decays. And EM decays are more likely than weak decays. And the lifetime of the particle is going to be governed by the total likelihood of all decays. So particles that can only decay through weak force, uh, weak interactions, are likely to live longer than those that can decay through strong. And to give you a sort of an idea, right, if you can decay through the strong force, lifetime is the order of 10 to the minus 23 seconds. Electromagnetic is about 10 to the minus 7, uh, 17, and the weak force is about 10 to the minus 8, roughly, right? I mean, it varies, um, you know, particularly, in fact, if you've got um, non-Kabibo suppressed decays can make a, a, a different, quite a big of a difference here. So... Um, but, but roughly to give you an order of magnitude. Um, okay, so I'll stop there. This is just a summary of what we've been talking about. And uh, next lecture on Thursday, we will talk about um, uh, symmetries. Okay, so for those of you that arrived late, uh, we voted to uh, uh, delay the assignment deadline till Thursday because you needed to know about weak interactions to answer some of the questions. So uh, I'll, I'll rejig the deadline so it'll be on Friday at 4 o'clock. Okay, any questions? No, good. Okay, so next time we start talking about symmetries. <laughs>